Salvation has always been costly. It costs God the Father his son. Yet it remains free to us. Friends, today we're going to look at Psalm chapter 49. And in this psalm, we're going to discover that we shouldn't put our hope in wealth, but that we should put our hope in the righteousness of Christ. Because Jesus is the one who gave his life, paid our ransom, and has made it possible for us to be redeemed back to God. You know, Dr. David Jeremiah says this about the Psalms. He says that when you read the Psalm, you find out your story before it was ever even written. You know, the Psalms are so relatable that when we look at them, we see our lives. We see the ups and the downs. We see the trials and difficulties met with great victory and joy. The Psalms are just so relatable, so much so that the Puritans, when they wrote the Bay Book of Psalms around 1640, they were asked, why did you print this book and no others? Well, they said, we couldn't print all of them, but the Psalms and the Bay Book of Psalms were the ones that we could focus in on we chose to do so because it covers such a variety of life. It goes through betrayal of friends, struggles, temptations, depression and anxiety, facing death, victories, joyful moments. It talks about family and wealth. It talks about finances and fun. It talks about work and worship. The Psalms are just covered with opportunities for us to better understand God in the midst of our circumstances. The sons of Korah are attributed for writing this psalm, Psalm 49. And the grand theme here is that we don't put our hope in wealth, but that we put our hope in eternity. Because money cannot buy you salvation. However, Salvation came at a great cost. Thanks be to Jesus. When you look at this psalm, it's really a great Old Testament reference to understand our lives in light of eternity. It's a great Old Testament psalm to help us better understand how we ought to be preparing for eternity. Let's read this giant psalm together, verses 1 through 20. Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all who inhabit the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth speaks wisdom, and my heart, heart's meditation brings understanding. I turn my ear to a proverb. I explain my riddle with a liar. Why should I fear in times of trouble? The iniquity of my foes surrounds me. They trust in their wealth, and they boast in the abundance of their riches. Yet, these cannot redeem a person or pay his ransom to God, since the price of redeeming him is, is too costly. One should forever stop trying, so that he may live forever and not see the pit. For one who can see that the wise die, the foolish and the stupid also pass away, then they leave their wealth to others, their graves and their permanent homes, their dwellings from generation to generation, though they have named estates after themselves. But despite his assets, mankind will not last. He is like the animals that perish. This is the way of those who are arrogant and of those who follow them, who approve of their words. Selah. Like sheep, they are headed for Sheol. Death will shepherd them. The upright will rule over them in the morning, and their form will, their form will waste away in Sheol, far from their lofty abode. But God will redeem me from the power of Sheol, for he will take me. Selah. Do not be afraid when a person gets riches, when the wealth of his house increases. For when he dies, he will take nothing at all. 
his wealth will not follow him down. Though he blesses himself during his lifetime, and you are acclaimed when you do well for yourself, he will go to the generation of his fathers. They will never see the light. Mankind with his assets, but without understanding, is like the animals that perish. Well, this is known as a riddle here. The riddle of riches that's found in Psalms 49 verses 1 through 4. It deals with what many of us spend most of our life on, money. We need money to buy our overpriced lattes from our favorite coffee shop. We need money to fund our kids' sports activities. We need money to save up for retirement. We need money to pay our bills. We need money to have a little fun. And today's psalm gives us a proper understanding of how we should relate to money when it comes to eternity. Things like understanding that wealth is just a a tool, and what you do with that tool makes all the difference. Are you using it for righteousness, or are you using it for your own desires? Are, are you using it for eternity, or are you simply using it for temporal matters? And this is a great riddle. What do you do with your money? Look again in those verses here. Hear this, all you peoples, in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 49. Listen, all who inhabit the world, both low and high, both rich and poor, together. My mouth speaks wisdom, and my heart's meditation brings understanding. I turn my ear to this proverb. Some might say, to a riddle. And I explain this proverb or this riddle with a song, with a lyre. I'm going to, with these next verses, flesh this out. But there's a, a riddle about riches here. And when you think about riches, you can think about it in a lot of different categories. You can think about it in the category of riches in material goods or items or things, money. You can think about it in aspect of riches in your relationships, to have rich friendships and relationships. You can think about it in the riches of wisdom and knowledge or riches in your own abilities. But this psalm with the sons of Korah here, as they were directed to lead the people of God in worship, they are speaking of what you do with material goods, riches in material wealth. The least important kind of wealth, if you were to ask me, but yet it's focusing in here on an aspect that all of humanity from the beginning of time till even now have wrestled with. There's a compare and contrast here to humans and animals. And we see that, that animals, they don't take anything with them. Animals, they don't have possessions or bank accounts in that regard. Animals are, are really free from material items and material goods. And humans, we've got freedom under the Lord, but yet we've got a lot of stuff. We put our hope in our riches oftentimes. And the Bible is going to teach us the importance of not focusing in on those material riches, not focusing in on money as the main priority of our life. The Bible has a lot to say about money and our relationship to it and how our relationship to it can bring glory to God or it can take us away from the Lord. It can distract us from executing our ultimate plan for our lives that God has for us. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, the Bible teaches us that we should keep our lives free from the love of money. So this riddle here is both for the high and the low, the rich and the poor. And what God's Word tells us no matter what station in life you found yourself in, that we should keep ourselves away from the love of money, that we should be satisfied with what we have. For he himself has said, 
I will never leave you nor abandon you. The point of this verse is that God is with you. He's with you always. And if you've got Jesus, you've got enough. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So loving money leads, it's the foundation, it's the root, it's the source of all kinds of of different evil. We see evil like greed. We see idolatry here. We see selfishness. I mean, the love of money leads to all kinds of different evil. And by craving it, by making it your top priority, by placing it above God, by having an improper relationship to money, some, they've even wandered away from their faith and pierce themselves with many griefs from stepping outside of the fellowship of the community of believers, some from making money their priority, making it their God, making it their idol, making it what they worship, elevating it above their relationship with God. So free yourself from the love of money because it can lead to all kinds of different evil. This riddle here that's proposed, this proverb is, simply put, money can distract us from God or money can direct us in the Lord. Where do you find yourself today in your relationship with money? The great riddle, are you high or low in your position and station in life? Are you rich or are you poor or do you feel somewhere in between. It doesn't matter what station in life you are. All of us have the temptation and the pull to make money a higher priority than the Lord. Are you using your finances for the glory of God or for just simply the hedonistic pleasure of self? The second section here in verses 5 through 12 tells us how we should spend our money, what our impact should be with money. We should be investing our life for an eternal impact. That's a pretty strong statement. If you were to go through your credit card, bank statement, your investment accounts, could this be said of you that you invest your life in eternal matters, in things that will carry on into eternity? Or simply put, are you consumed by a concept of temporal living? Are you putting your trust in wealth and your trust in something that won't last into eternity? Are you, in fact, using money to just fulfill selfish desires here on earth? And do you have an understanding that that, that won't get you into eternity? Money can't buy salvation. While salvation was costly, it cost Jesus his life. We shouldn't put our trust in our wealth. We should put our trust in God's righteousness. Look in verses 5 through 12 with me yet again. Well, why should I fear in times of trouble? The iniquity of my foes surrounds me. They trust in their wealth. See, the psalmist is showing us here that there are some people who are placing their hope in money, that they're placing their confidence in their wealth, that their identity is rooted in maybe the car they drive, the home that they live in, the bottom line on their bake statement. They're placing their identity, their value, and their own self-worth in their money. Verse 7 says, yet these things, they cannot redeem you. They can't pay your ransom to God. Since the price of redeeming a person, it's way too costly. One should forever stop trying to go down that road to, road to put your hope in money. Because if you alter that route and you put your hope in God, you will not 
see the pit of destruction. You will live forever with God in eternity. Verse 10 says, For one can see that, yes, even the wise die, and the foolish and the stupid, they pass away. But what happens to what they have left behind? It just simply gets left to others. Verses 11 through 12 says, Their graves are their permanent homes, their dwellings from generation to generation. Though they have named estates after themselves, though they've put their great hope in their assets, their, their names that they built for themselves here on earth, the reality is mankind will not last, won't last forever, just like the animals. We'll live a short life here on earth, and when we die, everything that is left behind will be passed on down to someone else. And so what we need to do is see that our lives are meant for something greater, something grander, that our lives have a purpose and a meaning that goes beyond the temporal, and it should be directed for the eternal. When we talk about the rich in this patch, passage, what kind of rich person are we talking about here? That's very important because I've known a lot of godly rich people. But this passage is talking about the ungodly who are wealthy putting their hope in their money. That that person needs to change lanes. That they need to alter the direction of their life that they need to steer away from that kind of thinking and walk in righteousness, that they need to put their hope in God and not their wealth. Those who trust in their wealth and not in the Lord will be sorely disappointed on the day that they die. So how do you know if you are putting your hope in your finances as opposed to putting your hope in God? I, I recorded a couple of different ideas. And I start here because the Bible teaches us a lot about what we do with the first fruits of our produce. Uh, what we do as the number one priority will direct the rest of our lives. And so if you are wondering, are you putting your hope in money or are you putting your hope in the Messiah? You could look and see if you give to the Lord at all. Are you generous to kingdom causes? Do you have a line item in your budget that gives to the Lord? If you don't give to the Lord at all, by your actions, you're actually putting your hope in your wealth. It might be fear-based. It, it might be based upon a lack of understanding. It might be pay, based on a tight budget or, or being a person who's stuck in debt, but your actions, they always speak louder than your words. And your actions reveal the ultimate intentions of your heart. And so if there's no category for God with your finances, you might be putting your hope in money as opposed to putting your hope in the Messiah. Uh, another thing is that you might find yourself fearful of losing it. Fearful of, of losing the value of your stock. Fe fearful of losing your job. Fearful of your car breaking down. Fearful of your credit card getting stolen. If you're routinely fearful with the things that involve money, if you're constantly being characterized by fear of what could happen to you, money in your life. Your relationship with money here is, is very fear-based, and it reveals that you've put your hope in it instead of the Lord. Maybe if you check your bank account, you check your stocks, you check your retirement portfolio, you check the Zillow value of your home in a unhealthy manner. I mean, you're checking it several times a day. Uh, not to make a decision that would be wise or best for you financially. You're just looking at it to see what happened. You are afraid of what you're going to see there. Uh, here's another category that reveals if we're putting our hope in money instead of God. And it's the idea of you're very greedy. You're not generous towards others. You know, you find yourself holding and hoarding and you don't have an open hand with the finances that the Lord has given you, with 
the wealth that you have, from the abilities that God has given you to make and create and add value in society. The opportunity that the Lord has given you to steward His resources He supplied for you, you've now said, I got a closed hand on that. God, I don't want to hear your voice in this. This is mine, all mine. I'm not going to give any of it away. I can't be generous to those who are in need because I am selfish. Here's another way that you find yourself putting your hope in money and not God is you brag about what you've got and what you've done. Uh, Maybe you're bragging about, and it's the humble brag, like, oh, my expensive vacation. Oh, my property taxes. Wouldn't believe how expensive they are these days. You're just bragging about what you've got. My car costs this much. Can you believe it? You're bragging on what you have instead of walking in humility, saying, I'm so grateful to God for what He has provided and given me. There are great indicators here that reveal to us where we put our hope. Are we putting it in the Lord or are we putting it in something else? You know, those who use their wealth for the glory of God have put their hope in Him. And they should be able to enjoy those blessings. It's not a sin to be rich or to be wealthy. We see many people in Scripture that have had means, and they use it for the glory of God. We see David wanting to build a temple and his son Solomon being able to build a house for the Lord. These are kings that had an enormous amount of money. King Solomon was known to be in what would be today's money, a trillionaire. Joseph of Arimathea, you know, opening up the tomb for Jesus. People using their finances for the glory of God. These people understand they can't put their hope or their trust in their wealth because they know it won't save them. Only God can save them. While salvation is costly, it remains free to you and I because Jesus paid the great price on our behalf. Verse 7 shows us clearly here in Psalm 49 that money won't buy you salvation. Don't put your hope in money because it won't get you anywhere in the long run. Only Jesus can redeem your soul, friends. You've got to have a proper understanding of money and eternity. In Proverbs chapter 11 verse 4, it speaks of what will happen on the day of wrath, on our day we die. It says wealth is not profitable on that day, the day of judgment, the day of wrath, but righteousness, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ, that can rescue us from death. In Hebrews 9, verse 27, the scripture tells us this, and just as it's appointed for a person to die once and face their judgment, that we will die and we will face judgment. We will face that day of wrath. And if we've put our hope in money and not in God, we will be disappointed. Psalms chapter 73, verse 24, tells us this. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me up in glory. Let the Lord guide you here on earth. Let God counsel you to do what He wants to do in and through you here on earth. And on that great day, He will take you up in glory glory. You've got to be content with what the Lord has given you, and you've got to be committed to use that for His glory. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 6 and 7 are a great representation of that. Frame this, right? Godliness with contentment is of gain, and it's of a great gain. For we were those who brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. Are you investing your life in things that matter for all of eternity? Your treasure will show you if you are or you are not. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. 
Don't store up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and still. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and still. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your treasure, what you do with money, it will reveal your heart. Does your heart have a, a, a longing for things that will matter for eternity? Do you long to see more saved and baptized and discipled? Do you long to see homes restored by Jesus? Do you long to see marriages brought back together? Do you long to see unity under the banner of Jesus Christ in the church? Do you long to see those who are addicted to drugs and alcohol and pornography? Do you long to see those people set free from their addictions and fall in love with Jesus? Do you long to see children find safety and security in the loving arms of their Savior? Do you long to see people impacted across the globe, not just here in our own land, but all across the world for the glory of God. Your treasure and what you do with it will tell you if your longings are accurate or not. Oh friends, let us be those who store up for ourselves treasures in heaven and not here on earth. We want the people we interact with, the sphere of influence the Lord has given us in this time of human history. We want our lives to be spent for the glory of God so that others can hear that God is the one who wants to save them. And God's the only one who can redeem them. That God is the only one that they should put their hope and their trust in, that we should never put our hope in wealth because it won't work. This last section, point number C, the riches that last are the riches of righteousness. There will be wood, hay, and stubble that will burn up, moth and rust where it will be destroyed. There will be things that will burn. They won't last into eternity. But the true riches that will last into eternity are the riches of righteousness. In verse 13, he's going to say, Selah, at the end here. Verse 15, he's going to come right back and say, Selah, once again. This reminder of reflection to pause. And what we see here is that we should be reflecting on the righteousness, the riches of righteousness, and the impact that that will make. Let's read together verse 13. It says, This is the way of those who are arrogant and of their followers. The way of the world, if you will, those who approve of their words. This is the way. So stop here and just think about these people and those who have put their hope in their own money and not in the Lord. This is the way. Verse 14 says, Like sheep, they're headed for Sheol, the place of death. Like sheep who will just follow, who are stupid as the scriptures show us. They will show us that death is what will shepherd them. The upright will rule over them in the morning and their form will waste away in Sheol, far from their lofty abode. But God will redeem me from the power of Sheol, for he will take me, Selah. These two pauses here, 13 and 15, a pause to think about the way of the world and its deathly direction 
versus the way of the Lord and the deliverance from that death into eternal life. The way of the unrighteous versus the way of the righteous. Verse 16 says, You shouldn't be afraid when a person gets rich, when the wealth of his house increases. You shouldn't be afraid of that. What you really should be afraid with uh, of is what a person does with their wealth. Because for when he dies, he'll take nothing at all. His wealth won't follow him down. Though he blesses himself during his lifetime, and you are acclaimed when you do well for yourself here on the earth, like a person who just keeps blessing himself, I've got this money, it's all for me, and others are looking, and they, they see the fancy Instagram posts, and the vacations, and the cars, and the jewelry, and the nice clothes, and the expensive fine dining. The world sees it, and they take note of it, and they, they bless that, but that person will go down to the generation of his father, so they're never going to see the light if they put their hope in their wealth and not in the Lord, they will end in destruction. Verse 20 concludes. He says, Mankind, with all of his assets, without understanding, is like the animals that perish. Uh, look here, what we see here. Verse 15 is one of those paramount phrases that we find in the Scripture. But God. But God. God always has a way of redeeming, making right, providing a way out, standing in contrast to this terrible way of living, offering hope, offering peace, offering comfort. The paramount phrase of but God. But God, He will take me. He will receive me. This passage here, it's using a phrase that's the same phrase used when Enoch was received into heaven. He walked with God and then he was not, right? We see here in Genesis chapter 5 verse 24 that when God took Enoch, he received Enoch this way. But God, God shall take me from the pit. God shall receive me in eternity when I put my hope in Him. Verses 17 through 18 are a little bit of a warning here. They're the warning of don't put your hope in unrighteousness, put it in righteousness because you can't take it with you when you die. So don't live for temporal things. Don't hold on to money for just yourself. Be a blessing to others, verse 18 shows us. Don't build for yourself a name here on earth that could be lifted high, but build and invest and direct your life towards things that will lift high the name of Jesus. Verses 19 through 20 shows us that when it comes to death, mankind is just like an animal. An animal can't take anything with them. And neither can we. Mankind with all of our assets will still perish. Mankind without understanding will perish. So whether you're rich or you're poor, you feel low or you feel high, gain understanding by placing your hope in the Lord. By placing your trust in the Lord. Live your life in such a way that it makes an impact for all of eternity. John Trapp, the Puritan, said this. And this is a great way to reflect on our lives. It's a great quote for us to think about our lives. Oh, that the wicked rich men would think of this before the cold grave has their bodies and that the hot hell holds their soul. Oh, that the wicked rich men would think of this before the cold grave has their bodies and the hot hell holds 
their souls. Oh, friends, before you die and your body goes cold and your soul is sent somewhere for all of eternity, oh, friends, do you have confidence that your life will be with God in heaven for all of eternity? Don't put your hope in the things of this world. Don't put your hope in what riches can do for you. Put your hope in the righteousness of Christ because true riches are the riches of righteousness. And when we are received by God in heaven because of the righteousness of Christ, we will have for ourselves treasures in heaven, mansions that the Lord has built for us. He is preparing a place for his sons and daughters. Make sure that you don't miss out on it by yielding your life to the Lord right now, surrendering your way to him, repenting from your sin, receiving that free gift of God's grace. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and today we simply want to put our hope in you and not the things of this world. If there's anyone that doesn't know you, may they proclaim today that you are Lord. May they admit their sins need to be forgiven by you, that the redemption of their souls came at a great price. It costed you, Lord, your son, Jesus, but you freely give us that gift of eternal life. And so we confess our need of it now. We believe in Jesus Christ and we commit our way to you now. If that person who doesn't know you could simply pray that prayer to you and that the Holy Spirit would indwell them and fill them and that the comfort of God would come alongside them, that the peace of God would be present with them and that that person could live the rest of their days for your glory, for things that matter, for a higher calling, for an eternal purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. And if you've been watching online but have never attended Anchor Church, we want to thank you for your support and your prayers. We'd love to connect with you in any way that we can. Feel free and reach out to us. You can leave a comment below. You can reach us at anchorchurch.com. God bless you. Let's finish our time praying and praising the wonderful name of Jesus. Yeah.